<clears throat> so how was your lunch? Good? So I realized that I did not read the very first line <laughs> on page seven. <laughs> the homage. I, I did discuss about paying homage, but I did not read this line. I pay homage to the foremost venerable Lama. I pay homage to the foremost venerable Lama. So, in Hindi it is called Batarak, whatever that means, Batarak, Batarak. So, literally translated, it is combination of two words. Jitsu, Jitsu, Lama Nam La Chaudhuri, Jitsu, J means Lord, Principal, Foremost. Right? So here the Lama is called the foremost one in terms of his spiritual practice. Chun means the one who practices what he teaches, disciplined one. So it has been loosely translated, Venerable Lama, whatever, you know. But the, the meaning is somebody who is very high in terms of his knowledge and also in terms of his practice. So I pay homage to such a Lama. Now Lama means superior. The, the word Lama is something like the word Guru in Hindi or Sanskrit. In Sanskrit and Hindi, Guru means is a combination of two letters, Guru. Gu means ignorance. Ru means rem remover. So Lama or Guru is somebody who helps remove your ignorance. <laughs> and the Lama in the true sense of the term, the, the Tibetan Lama means superior. Superior. Superior in terms of his knowledge, practice, quality. So don't call all the monks as Lamas. That's wrong. For example, I'm not Lama. I'm just an ordinary monk. So the Lamas, like His Holiness, Dalai Lama, and many other teachers, Lamas. So here, again, it's a thing happening in any society, in Tibetan society also, it's very confusing. So, so not all the monks are called Lamas. And not all those who are called as Lamas are also true Lamas in the true sense of the term. Sab kuch hota hai na? Sab kuch chalta hai So any, everything happens in a society, you know. So you need to find and look for a qualified Lama. So Lama, strictly speaking, is somebody who is superior in terms of his knowledge, in terms of his practice, so a qualified Lama or qualified teacher has to have many qualifications. But he should have, whether it's a Lama or a qualified teacher, he should have at least three main qualities. One, he should be, the most important qualities, he should be compassionate. 
we have been talking about the importance of love, compassion and so forth. So in the case of the teacher and the Lama, he should really have that compassion for his students, for his followers, for other practitioners, he should have compassion. Because if the Lama genu genuinely has compassion, then there is no room for the Lama to exploit the students. It's again human tendency. When you are in a higher pedestal and a privileged position, you tend to exploit people. People are more, who are more weaker, more vulner vulnerable, they come to you and you get a lot of opportunities to take advantage of them, exploit them, you know, financially, sexually, you know, in so many ways you can exploit them, right? So the most important thing is the Lama should be compassionate. Compassionate means one who sees that all these people have suffering. So my job is to remove their suffering, not to increase it. This is very important because in many, you know, ashrams or Buddhist centers also, many I should not say, but number of <laughs> ashrams and uh, centers, it happens, you know. People who normally go to a center are not necessarily those people who are highly educated and, uh, you know, very rich. Not many of these people come, unless you are very, very renowned, like His Holiness Dalai Lama, then maybe these people are attracted because they want to go to a similar level, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's how people think. So normally people who go to Dharma centers and ashrams are those people who have some problems in their life. Materially maybe not very rich or, I mean, generally speaking. Of course, exceptions are always there. So they go there. Now when they, they go there, they go there with the hope that some of their problems can be minimized. You, you get the needed help. Now imagine those same people who go there are exploited in their dharma center or ashram also. Then it's doubly like shocking, you see. It has happened. I know people who have had that experience who came to me sharing their stories. There's no harm in telling that story. I know one, uh, one nun French nun. She later on she became a Buddhist nun and uh, became very devoted to His Holiness Dalai Lama. At that time, I was translating for His Holiness. So she would, when she is here, she would invite me for a dinner or something. Like that. So I go for a dinner. Then she would always say, "You are very lucky. You are very lucky. You know, you 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 live with His Holiness Dalai Lama. You are so fortunate." And we, we feel very privileged if we are able to come here once in a year or once in two, three years. She would always say, say, say things like that. And she told me in the, when she was younger, she went to an ashram somewhere. She, was, she has relatively some money. So she gave a lot of money to build, you know, ashram and more buildings, things like that. She kept on spending money. And then uh, they wanted more money, and one day she said, I have no money left. Then the, the, the person there said, if you have no money, no place here, <laughs> go. <laughs> I have several stories like that, so which is pathetic, right? Which is not good, really. So that should not happen. The Lord, so therefore, the most important quality of a teacher and lama should be compassionate, we have compassion. Second important quality is he should have more knowledge and experience than the students. Otherwise, you can't teach. You can't share. <laughs> right? Third is he should be ready to spend some time with the students when they need your time. Make some effort. So at least these three things are there. There are many more. At least it's difficult to find somebody who has all the qualities mentioned in the text, but at least they should have some, some of these three, four qualities. So, so strictly speaking, Lama who is really, really qualified is not easy to find. A Lama who is really qualified should be someone who cares more about others than oneself. Now you can see, <laughs> it's, it's so difficult who cares more about others than oneself. 
who thinks more about next lives than this life. Not easy. It is very easy to get the title. You know, in the Tibetan society, there are so many so-called reincarnations. So these reincarnations are all said to be gurus. You know, guru means like high lamas. But then again, to be honest, you know, not, they, they are called reincarnations, but it's not necessarily they are all reincarnations. Who selected them? Again, other lamas, other teachers, who are those who selected them? They may themselves not know what, who they are, so how can they select other people? It's very tricky, these things are. So what I'm saying is, don't pay too much attention to the title. You can go and listen to anybody, it's up to you. But just by listening to somebody, they don't become your guru or teacher. Be very clear about that. Otherwise, some people who are not informed, they think, oh, I received teaching from him, he is my guru. No. It's like marriage. You can't say, oh, I like this person, so we are married. No. There is a ceremony, there is a commitment, all those things, you know. It's like, like, like that, you know. So when, when you're looking for a qualified lama or teacher, take time. Don't, don't be like a dog. The relation between a dog and a small piece of meat. If you throw a small piece of meat in front of the hungry dog, it's no time to test. He'll immediately jump and eat. Don't, don't jump immediately. And also when you're looking for a teacher, don't see how handsome he is, how beautiful she is. People also do that. I know that. Right? There are many stories, you know, and I don't want to waste your time. So therefore, practice what we call as four reliances. I'm not talking about the reliance company. Huh? Four reliances. Four reliances means when you are looking for a teacher or teaching, the first reliance is don't rely on the teacher or the person, but rely on the teaching. Don't rely on the te teacher means don't just simply rush because somebody is very famous. Right? As I said, of course you can go and listen, but important thing is pay more attention to his teaching. Rely more on the teaching, the authenticity of the teaching than the fame of the teacher. Now, when you listen to the teaching, pay more attention to the meaning than the beauty of the word. Words may be very beautiful, but if it is devoid of meaning, it doesn't touch your heart or doesn't impact your life. It is not so useful. Right? Now, when it comes to understanding the meaning, rely more on the definitive meaning than on the interpretative meaning. As I already explained, Buddha's teaching is of two kinds, interpretative and definitive. So rely, at the end of the day, you need to get the definitive teaching, not the interpretative one. Rely more on the definitive teaching than on the interpretative teaching. Now when it comes to understanding the definitive teaching, rely more on the wisdom mind, the pristine consciousness, then, then on the understanding of your, by your gross mind. Don't rely on gross consciousness, but rely more on the pristine wisdom consciousness. Wisdom, using your reason. Okay, not just, meaning that don't rely on like some superficial understanding based on your gross consciousness. Means you think about, you talk and discuss, think about, you know, emptiness using your ordinary mental consciousness, gross mind. You'll get, develop some understanding. But th that's not very deep. So therefore meditate and try to use the subtle most mind, the pristine consciousness as we call it, the primordial consciousness as we call it. Try to understand that subtle meaning by using that pristine, primordial wisdom consciousness. 
right? So these are the four reliances. Okay? Then as I already mentioned about the importance of faith, three types of faith I've already explained. Then students who follow the Mahayana teaching, they are also encouraged to develop the, the, the genuine faith, not the uh, not so useful faith, I would say. For example, two types of faith. Faith developed by people whose minds are not very clever. And faith developed by people whose minds are very analytical. In other words, don't simply follow people, eloquent people, without due examination. If you do that, you will, in the long run, you will get lost. Today, you listen to a Buddhist teacher. Sounds good. You have no capacity to judge any lies. Sounds good. You follow it. Tomorrow, you meet a Christian teacher. Sounds good. You follow it. Then next day, Hindu teacher or whatever. Countless teachers. So, so what, what is your path? So therefore, people normally ask this question, you know, which one is better? To study all religions and follow all the great teachers or just choose one line of thinking, one teacher? I answer it by saying that this is like going to school, you know. When you are in a lower school, first class, second class, third class, and so forth, until 12th class, 11th class. You have many subjects. Study all the subjects. But when you grow up, study more, do your PhD, you specialize. You have very few subjects because you are specializing now. It's like that. <coughs> For general practice, okay. Get some inspiration <coughs> from this religion, their religion. <coughs> it is okay. But if you really want to reach somewhere, like I'm coming to Tushita, you know, they are even coming to Tushita from Meglogan, there are so many roads. So you go a little bit there, a little bit there, a little bit, and nobody can stop that. But you will not reach here. <laughs> right? <laughs> so go. <laughs> Choose the one which is maybe quicker or safer, whatever, and, and continuously go and you will reach somewhere. It's like that, right? So therefore, what I was saying was, don't run too much after name and fame, be it Tibetan lamas, be it Bollywood actor, actress, Hollywood actor, actress, president, prime minister, whatever. Don't just run after them because of their name, right? People are not exactly like what you see on the screen. <laughs> I've, 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 I've met many of these Hollywood and Bollywood actors and actresses. I first saw them on the screen. Oh, wow, so good. Such good acting. But when you meet them, like you and me, nothing special. <laughs> right? <laughs> They may have their talent. I'm not saying that they are stupid or anything. They may have their special talent, but not so much that, that you have to like get completely mesmerized by seeing them. You know? Because th this is what I'm saying, you know. Your, your mind is making everything. I remember that occasion when it came out in the newspaper that Michael Jackson is coming to India, Delhi, New Delhi. Many young people, especially young girls, they were like, ah, Michael Jackson is coming. <laughs> and then news came, oh, he canceled his visit. <laughs> Many were fainting. But this is nothing compared to what you actually see in some of the shows, when Michael Jackson is actually on the stage and dancing. There are many young people just fainting and collapsing. And there we have special people, I don't know what they call it, who are there to look after them and carry their fainted body outside. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's no limit to craziness, really. 
And I'm, I'm not jealous. <laughs> I'm not jealous. I mean, you can admire anybody's talent. You can say, yes, this is wonderful. There's nothing wrong with that. But to go such an extent. And I'm saying this, I'm somebody who had my, made Michael Jackson. <laughs> And I did not faint, yes, <laughs> you are right. <laughs> and in fact, I escorted him. I was then translated to his holiness, Dalai Lama. I escorted him. So three of us were sitting together. <laughs> and I was the photographer, imagine. <laughs> I did not faint, you know. <laughs> I was curious, oh, this is how he looks, you know. <laughs> so similarly, I met many of these Hollywood, Bollywood actors, actresses, you know. I mean, as I said, you know, admire, okay, they have their talent, good, wonderful, but, but don't, don't make them crazy. Many people think, oh, if I just get his signature. <laughs> again, getting signatures, okay, but again, don't. <laughs> I, once, I once was traveling in South India. It happened a few times. Went to a very a place where people, the local villagers and others, are very, very devoted. Many of them are followers of Sai Baba, you know. So I met some of them. So I gave a talk, and after that, some of them came and asked me to put my signature. So I was putting my signature, and they were sharing. I, I, I know Hindi. So they were talking to, see, see the power. See? They are, they are creating it. I know, I was just. Deep down, I was, I could not help laughing. I have nothing, I know myself. <laughs> People think like that, you see. I mean, always think about good things, so that way, I mean, it should be okay, but don't go to the extent so that you will be fooled by this so-called this <laughs> great person or great people, you see. So that, that's what I'm saying. So, those who have the title Lama don't necessarily qualify it, Lama. Those who have the title Tulku Rinpoche. Rinpoche, Tibetan word Rinpoche means the precious one, precious one. And then the, the Tulku means reincarnation. Reincarnation means not like you and me. According to Buddhist teaching, you and I, we came into this world not out of our choice. We are projected in this world through the force of negative emotions and contaminated actions. We had no choice. And I understand that. Because I did not choose when, when to, to be born, <laughs> right? Similarly, I can't choose when to die. So obviously we are ordinary people. Now these so-called reincarnations are supposed to be the ones who, who came not out of the power of negative emotions and karma, but through compassion and through their choice. So again, I'm not saying there's no reincarnation. I'm not saying everybody is false. But there are many false reincarnations. And that also blame also not necessarily go to the person. The, the blame goes to the, those who, who chose them. Because when you, when you are selected as a reincarnation, then people again normally don't question, so the, if somebody says he's high reincarnation, everybody will think, yeah, Rinpoche, reincarnation, yeah. So, so the reincarnation, when once you, you get this title, you get certain privileged positions. Helpers, assistants, you know, and uh, property, so many things. So that's why people Manipulative people or politicians, they choose somebody saying, this is my Lama, this is reincarnated one. So that's why when I go to, <laughs> this is another joke, when I go to teach, I used to go to teach in Israel and Russia and Amer America, obviously not much before. I, I traveled with his oldness many times, Singapore, things like that. So sometimes I jokingly tell people, you need to pay me double or triple than what you give to the so-called lamas. Because the so-called lamas, they can't teach in English. 
they teach in Tibetan. They have a translator. So which means they, they, if, if it is uh, teaching for one hour, they are actually teaching half an hour. Half an, half an hour for translation. Then they have attendants, maybe some cases one, some cases two, three. So when you invite them, you need to pay for all their tickets. And also maybe a little better hotel or things like that. So I jokingly <laughs> tell them, I need to get all this money. <laughs> You can put me in a simple room, this is an ordinary monk. But you should compensate those other things. <laughs> this is a job, you know. But, but I'm, I'm not trying to bring down the fame of Lama or reincarnate, things like that. But all I'm saying is we live in ordinary society, right? So we need to, we need to be careful. Don't just run after name and fame. That's all I'm saying. Of course, I have high regard for great lamas and uh, real teachers, and not only teachers, but ordinary people, among ordinary people who may have no title, no designation. If you look closely, some of them are better than lamas and teachers. It's only a question of recognizing. So our job is to pay respect to everybody who is, to everybody in general, and especially those who, who have these great qualities as an ordinary person. They don't announce, they don't make it a big issue, but they are doing their work silently. So that's really great, right? So here, you should understand the meaning of this. Lama Nam La Chang Sol, I pay homage to the foremost disciplined lamas. That's the meaning, okay? So then we already read uh, the first words. <laughs> I will explain as well as I can. This is, again, when he says, I will explain as well as I can, this is a, a statement of humility. He can, of course, explain it very well, but uh, he says, I will try. <laughs> <laughs> so the essence of all the teachings of the Buddha is renunciation, because if you don't develop renunciation, if you don't develop bodhicitta, if you don't develop wisdom, em uh, empty, uh, wisdom realizing emptiness, you won't reach any, anywhere. So, so the meaning is all these three lines should be uh, applied to all the three principal aspects of the path. Because the purpose of your study and practice is to become Buddha, to completely get enlightened. To get completely enlightened, you need two things, very important. Bodhicitta, the heart, and wisdom, understanding, emptiness, the head, the knowledge. Right? Now, this development of the heart generally speaking, must be based on development of the head. That means when you use your head and wisdom and analyze and see the uh, vulnerabilities or fragilities or sufferings of people, then you develop the heart, compassion. Yes, I must do something. I must do something. I remember his old in the Dalai Lama once, I was as, as the translator sitting on on uh, on, the, on the side, there was a big table in front of us. Then there was somebody there. I was there as translator. His Holiness was here, so he was explaining about the need to develop this compassion with wisdom. If you don't have the wisdom, you don't see the reality. And when you don't see the reality, you can't develop compassion. Then he gave an example by saying that, for example, on this table, if there is a few drops of water here. And then there is an ant here who is very thirsty. And the ant is going, you know, searching for water. He goes like this, comes very close to the water, and then turns back and go. That's what they do all the time, you know. So, so it's like this. When we don't have the wisdom, there may be many things which is easily achievable, but, but we will turn away from it. So therefore, the, the, the reliable, Compassion, loving kindness must be developed based on knowledge and understanding, not out of faith. Not out of faith. And then all these qualities related to the heart, like loving kindness, compassion, bodhicitta, these are very, very important, but they don't have the capacity to uproot the root cause of suffering, ignorance. Right? So that you should understand. We'll, we'll talk more about this later on. Okay. Okay, so you need two things, bodhicitta, wisdom, understanding, emptiness. But you will not develop bodhicitta, wisdom, understanding, emptiness, unless you have seen the fragility and limitations of this cycle of existence. 
there is a beautiful stanza by Arya Deva in his text, famous text called 400 Verses, where he says, uh, the person who is not disgust, who, who has not developed, developed kind of discussion or sadness with this life in the samsara will never develop respect to liberation and nirvana. And he gives an example by saying, for example, if you are somebody who is feeling very happy with your present home in Bombay or Delhi or you know New York or somewhere, if you are very happy, the neighbors are good, you are happy, you are living harmoniously with your family members, why should you think about moving to some other place? It's only when you start seeing the problems in the family, in the neighborhood, right? Then you start, day and night you will think, especially if the problem is big, day and night you think about moving to other place. So similarly, you will not think about moving to liberation and nirvan unless you have seen the problems of this samsara. And these problems are real problems. We are not, not trying to just find some problem and it's, it's not like, you know, you don't like somebody, then you pick up some fault. <laughs> it's not like that. The problems are there. But because of our lack of wisdom, we are not able to see it. For example, as I told you this morning, suffering of suffering, we have some understanding. Suffering of change, we have no understanding. And that understanding will come through study, through reflection, through meditation. And then especially the conditioned suffering. You see, so here as a practitioner, when we talk about developing that renunciation and developing a wish to achieve uh, that, that state of nirvana and liberation, Right? So there you need to see not only suffering of suffering and suffering of change, but you need to see the condition of suffering. When you are very clear that you will not be able to enjoy real long lasting happiness so long as you are under the grief and control of negative emotions, then you make a promise, yes, my job is to fight against these negative emotions, to eliminate them. Right? Then you aspire to achieve liberation. How nice if I'm free from this. Everybody wants freedom, right? Everybody wants independence. The independence that we are talking in terms of politics, in terms of con independence of country, this is like very false meaning of freedom and independence. I mean, you may be living in an independent country, but how much suffering is there in that so-called independent country? So long as you are surrounded by people who bully you, who exploit you, who discriminate you. Now what do you mean by living in an independent free country? Right? So the real freedom, independence will not be there unless you get rid of these torturers, the oppressors, the negative emotions. You may be sleeping in a five-star hotel. You may have a lot of money, but so long as you have these negative emotions, jealousy, hatred, you know, inside you, you can never be happy. As, as the seventh Dalai Lama, in one of his very famous prayer, he says, the, the people at a lower level, they always suffer because they are enslaved, they have to work like anything, you know, day and night, they, they have no choice, right? And I've, I've seen, when I go to Delhi, when you travel in the metro, you will see some of these laborers who have been working the whole night, and then as soon as they enter the metro, they are just, just dozing off. So tired. This is a <laughs> daily common sight that you can see. So ordinary people suffer like that. They undergo a lot of physical hardships. What about the, the higher ones, the richer people? They have more mental problems. Jealousy, hatred, computation. You know, my my rich neighbor has ten cars. I should have twelve cars. So that's why now we have the so-called rich people. Some of them have how many cars they have? Some of them have over hundred. I've been watching all these so-called rich people. I've, I've been, you know, even even studying what kind of luxurious wealth they have at their disposal. Unbelievable that just one person is a whole nation. 
one person is a whole nation. <laughs> there is a teaching in Shanti Devas Bodhichara Avatara where he says, okay, you are very rich. Now, because you are rich, the pot where you should vomit should be made of gold. <laughs> this is happening actually. You drink from, from the silver and golden. It's happening today. This is all stupidity. Never think about death, never think about it. I mean, just drinking from the golden bowl and silver cup doesn't mean you, you will never die. Again, I am not jealous, but <laughs> but <laughs> it's not, not useful. Useful. If you are rich, okay, but share a little bit about, share a little bit your wealth to so many people, you know, make so many people. You can, if you are rich, you can make so many people happy. Your fame and name, will, if you want fame and name, it will come naturally, automatically, in the, in the true sense of the term, not the flattery that you get when you get high post. Right? So, okay. Next line, next verse. Exhorting the disciples to listen. Asking the disciples to listen. Exhorting is a very strong word. Exhorting the disciples to listen. Those who are not attached to the joys of cycle existence, strive to make meaning of their leisure and opportunity, rely on the path pleasing to the conqueror, those fortunate ones listen with a clear mind. So this is, he make, makes his promise, saying that I will compose this text, and in fact he's written this, and now he's asking the fortunate disciples to listen to it. Fortunate disciples, those of you who are listening, including me, we are fortunate. Even if we are able to spend one day, one hour listening to such a text, from the Buddhist perspective, we call it fortunate person. You cannot make your life better than what you are doing right now. You may not see it right now, but when you get problem, difficulty, you will see it. I'll tell you a story of one Western nun who came to see me some years back. And she said, uh, Geshila, I've been in living in Dharamsala for many, many years, and I don't see any spiritual progress. What should I do? Then I said, go back to your country. That was a little bit blunt, right? I said that, with a meaning. So she must have, she must have, she may not have liked what I said, whatever, anyway, she, she left. Then after some time, I don't know how many months or something, I don't know, she came back and she said, Geshila, thank you. I said, what? When we met, you know, I told you this and you said, go back to your country. I didn't understand, now I understood. I said, how? Because when in Dharamsala, I thought I am not making any spiritual progress for so many years living here. When I went back to my country, I was able to clearly see why people are doing all these things all these useless things. I was able to clearly see the progress I've made. You see? So therefore, many of these things that you are listening to right now may not seem very impactful or something like that, but try to at least some of those points which you, you felt is useful, impactful. Remember that it will help you. Because at the end of the day, unless you have these inner resources to pull out, nobody can help you. Nobody can help you. So help yourself to help others. Help others to help yourself. <laughs> that is the law. So your, your helping others is not a sacrifice that you are making. It's actually good for you. Help others. It's helping others is helping yourself. And helping yourself is helping others. In my case, for example, I helped myself, and that way I helped my family. <laughs> for example, at a very young age, I went to school. Then I went to monastery. So I could not help any of my parents. My father died when I was very young. Mother also passed away when I was in a school. Then I had a lot of other, you know, very close relatives. I could not help any of them. 
So when I was grown up and studying in the monastery as a monk in Dhamsala, I very often I used to think I could not help them. But then later on I realized I had actually helped them by not helping them in a sense. Because I have other brothers and uh, cousins who left school and stayed with the parents. Yes, they helped a little bit here and there, of course, doing the things together. But sometimes instead of helping them, they themselves have become burden to the family members. They got sick and the family members have to look after them. None of my fam family members so far had to look after me. <laughs> they don't have to worry about me. They were quite satisfied because I was studying well, I was doing well in the ordinary school, in the monasteries, I was doing well. Then I became his holiness translator. They were like over the moon. They were so happy, you know. It's not just giving money, right? So now I'm in a position to guide them and uh, sometimes a little bit monetary help also possible, you know. I did not work for money, that's for sure. But if you do your work properly, sincerely, you know, that's the best way of helping others. So help yourself. If you remain healthy, happy, your relatives will be happy. So there are many ways of helping them, not just giving money. Okay. So, those who are not attached to the joys of the cycle existence. So, <laughs> this is as a challenging, challenging line. If you continue to stay where you are right now, he's saying then this may not be very useful. If you continue to stick to the diehard habit, this, this may not be very useful. So this is for those who are not attached to the joys of cycle existence. Yes, we are all attached to the joys of cycle ex existence. So the meaning is, if you are not among those who at least is, if you are, you are among those who are at least attempting to remove the attachment to this samsara, so this is for you. At least you are attempting, that's the meaning. He's not saying that you have no attachment. If there's no attachment, no, we no, don't need any teaching also. So the meaning here is those who are not excessively attached or who want to remove the attachment, to the joys of cycle existence, then it's for you. But if you if you say, why are you are talking about removing the attachment? I want to have this strong attachment to my brother, sisters, wife, husband, boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, this is not for me. You are you are destroying my peace. <laughs> you know? So shut up. So, so there are people who say this, people who, who say people who are so-called very independent people, straightforward people, they say things like that, you know. So then this is not for you, this is what he's saying. In Hindi, we say, eat, drink, and In Hindi, we say, in, there's, a, there's a kind of a saying where people say, eat, drink, the f it is four days life, just, just, just enjoy life. Who, who has seen the next life? There are people who say this. So this, in these areas you need to think carefully. People who say, you know, enjoy as much as you can. Buddhism is also not against enjoyment. Buddhism is against addiction, right? Senseless enjoyment, unchecked enjoyment, right? So this is people who say things like that, they, they are almost like equal to saying that today is the only day. Who has seen tomorrow? What is the guarantee that you will be here tomorrow? Right? Is there any guarantee? If I ask you, can you please, those of you who think that you will not die tomorrow, can you please put your signature? I'm sure you will come here 
and try to be brave and put the signature, but at the same time, you know, I'm just putting the signature. I'm not so sure, right? <laughs> you know? So you're not so sure, but still you think there's, there will be tomorrow and you work for it. And then also tonight when you go to bed, there's no guarantee that you will wake up tomorrow morning. Right? So, so death is like that. Death is like a little bit longer sleep. But the continuity of mind will be there. So depending upon what you've done, you will, you will experience that, that joy, that happiness, that sorrow, that sadness, depending upon in what area you had made your mind habituated. Right? So therefore we need to think about future lives. Or at least not necessarily future, but future means not necessarily after death. Future means tomorrow. You have to think about tomorrow. You have to think about next month. You have to think about next year. Right? Because even if you physically die, in many cases, we will live for many, many years, I pray. But even if you physically die, your mind will not disappear into nothingness. Although this is a delicate area, not easy to prove, but now there are many people who came up with evidence of past life. If there is a past life, there will be future life. Them now, it's a recorded. People who remember their past, past life, thousands of people who remember their past life have been recorded scientifically. There is a scientific community in New York who do this research all over the world. Many people have written this book. First, they started writing this book in Sri Lanka and India because we, we, we had, because they thought that this is only a question of belief. It may not be, not be there in the West. So later on, they did the same experiment in in the Western countries. They found people who remember the same thing. And my own institute, Library of Tibetan and Walks and Archives, interviewed some young people who said they remember their past, past lives. It's very convincing. There was a very young little girl who people say she remembered her past life. So we interviewed her. And we found that uh, even as a little girl, she is always thirsty. Wanted to drink water. Very unique. Always thirsty. And she remembered in her past life she was a drunkard. <laughs> <laughs> and there was another girl who was, as soon as there's the rain, she gets very scared. And she remembered her past life she said in a past life she went with some friends to, to, uh, to, uh, to the water to swim and she, she drowned there and died. Even more convincing than that was there were many stories like that. There was one young girl who remembered her past life. I think that may be probably in the West somewhere. So she remembered that in her past life she was shot by somebody and killed. The bullet hit here and came out from here. She remembered that. And in this very life, she had a bulge here and a bulge there. Not only she remembered the life, but she also carried the symptoms, the physical remnants. This happens because if you die a natural death, there is less likelihood of remembering past lives. But if you die through accident, you know, there is a span of life where you, you are supposed to live. And then before you finish the span of life, there is a car accident, shorten your, your life, then the remaining part of the drama has to be played again. So there are many interesting stories like that. I invited one of them during a conference here in Dharamsala. We have the recordings of his talk, and I have several of the books published by them. So how, how is it possible? In Punjab, you may or may not remember, there was, in Punjab there was one girl she remembered her past life very clearly. She remembered the, her parents also, their location, their name. She always said, I want to go to see my parents, to the new parents. She said, I want to go and see my parents. 
So she was always saying things. So out of curiosity, they took, and she was showing the, the, the road, the path, this way, this way, not here, no, no, here, there, here, there. She finally goes there, she remembered name, everything, parents were still alive. So she had <laughs> parent of this life and the past life. And His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, when hearing this, she sent uh, people to interview her, and then later on, she also came to see His Holiness. Many cases like that. So how 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 do people remember past life? Because when you die, you destroy your brain and everything. So the possibility is your imprint, habit that you have left on your mind, and the mind continues and remember those things. And among the qualified reincarnations, there are people who remember their past life very well. If you read His Holiness the Dalai Lama's My Land and My People how he was recognized. You know, when he was recognized, there are many interesting things, but one thing that they did was, on a big table, they put 16 different articles, looking similar, two drums, two walking sticks, and things like that, 16 different articles, looking very similar. And they asked this little boy, His Holiness Dalai Lama, to recognize it. He recognized everything perfectly, except the walking stick. With the walking stick, he first picked up the wrong one, looked at it carefully, then put it back and take the right one. And then later on, when people tried to find out why he made this con confusion, he found this walking stick was also with the Thirteen Dalai Lama for some time. Many interesting things like that. So this is, this is not fabricated, you know, his oldness is still alive. <laughs> right? So these mysterious things are also there. Many mysterious things. Then, then, then also there was a story of a Tibetan Lama who was caught by the Chinese army. And he was being taken to some other place. He was on his way. Suddenly there was a kind of, what do you call it, tornado? Small cycle of wind with the dust. And when this tornado vanished, stopped, the Lama also disappeared. It has happened only some years back. No, I'm not talking about like 100 years back or 10,000 years back, things like that. Then there was another, another very interesting Lama practitioner. He was caught and he was to be shot during a you know, struggle session. So when he was about to, sh to be shot, the Lama said, I have one last request. And then the Chinese soldiers or whoever, the custodian, they said, okay, what is your last wish? He said, I want to do a prayer, short prayer. He said, okay, do your prayer. Then he recited this prayer. And then after he finished the prayer, without any sign of fear and worry, he said, okay, I've done my prayer, please shoot me. And the prayer, you know, what he said was, I, I invoke the compassionate Lama. May I today be able to take upon me all the sins and sufferings of all my mother sending beings. And may I be able to offer all the good things that I've done for the well-being of all mother sending beings. So, so if, you, if you practice, you can develop such courage, such determination. It's possible. And he said, okay, shoot me. Fully knowing that nobody can kill anybody <laughs> in the true sense of the term. It is only elimination of the body, you know. So therefore, from that balance, when we die also, there's nothing to worry, actually. If you had lived a good life, meaningful life, nothing to worry. Because death is like changing the cloth. You don't develop fear when you change your clothes. Do you develop fear when you change your clothes? <laughs> You'll be happy, okay, I'm wearing the new jacket. So when you take a new, new rebirth, especially when you're grown, grown up, you know, then it's time to shed the coat and, and get new clothes and born new baby, like that. Right? Okay. So, 
those who are not attached to the joys of the cycle existence. That means you should, if you want to really, what I want to encourage you is to lessen your attachment to this samsara. And not only that, the other thing that you need to do is strive to make meaning of this leisure and opportunity, it means this precious human life. Where you have leisure means where you have freedom to do Dharma practice. Where you have facilities to do Dharma practice. Where you have... So don't say you have no time to do Dharma practice. This is again another big issue today, these days. Right? People, people say, yeah, I want to do some Dharma practice, but I'm so busy. I have no time. Clearly, clearly saying that your priority is something else. <laughs> Again, I remember very well once His Holiness, that was before I became His translator, when His Holiness was giving a teaching to a group from France in the main temple. So during the question answer session, a French lady, she got up and said, your Holiness, your teaching is so wonderful, so amazing, but in the West we are so busy, we have no time to do practice, what should we do? His Holiness said, it is up to you whether you want to do Dharma practice or not. <laughs> Sounds like a little bit blunt, right? But he was really kidding. He's saying it's up to you whether you, you see any meaning in it or not. If you see a meaning in it, you have to find the time. Football players find time, musicians find time, everybody when they have the interest they find time. I've seen people who are so interested in playing football, even when they're on the deathbed, they're like, try to kick the football under the bed. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> so you, you need to see what is important. Right? And we are not saying you don't work, we, we are not saying you don't you get divorced, we are not saying that. We are not saying that. What we are saying is, spend some time. And His Holiness's advice is 50-50. Meaning 50% for this life, 50% for next life, 50% for material collection, 50% for spiritual accumulation. Right? And then here you need to think carefully, you know, which one is important, more important, your mind or your body? Huh? Both. This is a diplomatic answer. <laughs> which one is important? Exactly the same? In other words, I, I should ask the question, which one has an upper hand? Who is the boss? That's what I'm saying. I said this yesterday also. Because one that controls your, your life, your body and everything is your mind. Right? So therefore that, that boss, the mind has to be good. If the boss is good, the president is good, the prime minister is good, then he will take good care of the citizens. So the mind is very important. But, but it is the mind which is neglected most of the time. For the body, we we are not good, but we are trying our best to clothe it, to feed it. We are not good, as I said, we eat junk food and things like that. So we are, th here also we are not very great, but we are trying our best at least. Some yoga, some meditation, but, but for the mind, generally speaking, I'm not talking to your group, but in general, for the mind we don't do much. So much of the problem that we experience in today's world is clear indication of starvation of human mind. Starvation of human mind. Right? Okay. So, strive to make meaning of this precious human life. You may not get such precious human life again and again. At, at least from Buddhist viewpoint. So seize this opportunity. How much of the time you already spent? And of the remaining period, 
nobody knows how long you are, long you are going to live. Even if you live, again you have to sleep the whole night. Then in the day, so many areas where you can get distracted, food, clothing, talking, chatting, walking, so many things. There's really not much time. But I'm not discouraging. But if you get the essence, like these three principal aspects of was for the path. And even for like, <coughs> say, 20 minutes every day. You have to make that kind of dedication. At least I'm saying 20 minutes every day, I will study three verses and understand the meaning properly and relate it to my life. I'll practice it. Like, for example, in my case, I memorized the whole text long before, I mean, not the commentary, the root text. And I'm not one of the, the best practitioner. <laughs> so so when, whenever you know, I have a problem, for example, when I have to give a talk, or when I have a personal problem, things like that, then I recall some of these verses. So useful. So you don't have to memorize the whole text from the beginning to the end. But for example, as I said, if you don't have probably it's a good those of you you know who really want I, we have some extra copies also this shanti devas bodhicharya avatara so this is one of those books and memorize some of the verses or at least remember the meaning of the some of the verses for example in shanti devas text there is one verse where it says if it is something you can change no need to worry because you can change if it is something you can't change it no use worrying because you can't change it things like that things like that it will help you tremendously right so it's important so so be be tactful and clever Strive to make meaning of the leisure and opportunity. As I said, you should understand what is the meaning of human life. Is human life only for eating, sleeping, and having sex? Or more than that? We are human beings, not animals. Animals also do all those things. They also fight. They also look for food. Right? They also have their mating sessions, seasons and things like that. So we have this big brain. The brain is over one kilo, more than one kilo. The weight of our brain is more than one kilo. <laughs> so why you carry this heavy brain all the time without using it? <laughs> so, so use it, use it. And find out the meaning of the special way you can fulfill the meaning of your human life which no other animals can do, right? So, so if you are the one who wants to remove this attachment to the samsara, who wants to make your meaning, uh, life of life meaningful, then you should rely on the path pleasing to the Buddha, the path of the three principal aspects of the path that we are reading. Rely on this path taught by the Buddha. But to Tsongkhaba, this was taught to Tsongkhaba by Manjushri. Manjushri. So this reminded me to teach you a Manjushri mantra. Mantra, Manjushri mantra. I mean, just recite this, very interesting. As I read this morning, it is said that the two most powerful ways of developing wisdom oneself are to study these profound sutras and to meditate upon Manjushri. I read this earlier. Then it says, it is the custom of Tibetan school children and also of monks and nuns to recite the mantra of Manjushri the first thing each morning. We used to do that when we were in school. The, as soon as we wake up, then we, we used to recite this mantra each morning and to repeat over and over the seed syllable D that embodies of essence of his wisdom. So that is, now repeat after me. Om, Ara, Pacha, Nadi. Om, Ara, Pacha, Nadi. Om, Ara, Pacha, Nadi. 
Omar Abbas and Nadi, Omar Abbas and Nadi. Then we recite Omar Abbas and Nadi. Di, 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 Many D you can say in one breath. <laughs> and this, this mantra, of course, the most important thing is the visualization part of Manjushri. There is a whole sadhana. This is said to be very, very good for impro improving your intelligence, wisdom. And the recitation of this word, you can already feel it to some extent. D saying this, it will sharpen your tongue. You become very eloquent. D, 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 D. So I may be exaggerating a little bit. Perhaps due to this, Tibetans have a very good tongue. They learn different languages quite nicely. Huh? Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So you become clever and yeah, yeah. Yeah, like that. Omar Abazana di 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 this is what we do in the morning. Right? So these are interesting things. Then another thing that uh, you requested yesterday to recite a line from Tsongkhaba, praising Tsongkhaba. So this also we will do, because this text is written by Tsongkhaba. And who is Tsongkhaba? Tsongkhaba is somebody. For example, here it says, just to get an idea, during China's so-called cultural revolution, when the Red Guards wrecked their greatest destruction in Tibet, among the many priceless treasures they desecrated and plundered was a tomb at Ganden Monastery, Monastery near Lhasa. They were amazed to discover that the body it contained was uncorrupted, body of Tsongkhaba. Its hair and fingernails still growing after five centuries. This is Tsongkhaba. And I, I myself personally know one lama, a lay, lay person, he's not a monk, but a lama, who died in Nepal. And his devotees wanted to bring his dead body to the Orissa, where my relatives live right now. So then the 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 border guards and others, police, and they said, yeah, how, can, how can you take this dead body? It will start smelling. They said, no, no, this is very unique teacher, great teacher, I think. So somehow they were able to impress upon them and they allowed them to bring the body. Then it is housed in a temple in Orissa, which is a very hot area, you know. Every year they have to cut the hair. When there is a special, like, uh, a disease among the people, and then this image will develop pimples on its face, and the problem among the people gets lessened or reduced or disappear, things like that. It is, it is still there. So, this is Ongaba. And the more important thing is, This, these were the remains of Lama Jetsongkhaba, who lived between 1357 to 1419. One of the outstanding figures of Tibet's long and illustrious religious history. The story of this remarkable yogi, teacher, and prolific author begins at the time of Shakyamuni Buddha 2,500 years ago. On one occasion, a young boy offered Buddha a conch shell, his previous life, Tsongkhapa's previous life, conch shell, symbol of propagation of Dharma, the sound. Buddha then prof prophesied or prophesied? Prophesied. <laughs> I don't know. Prophesied. <laughs> I used to say prophesied. <laughs> prophesied. <laughs> because whether it's Tibetan, English, or Hindi, you know, it's so easy, you know. Uh, sorry, so 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 problem, problematic. Tibetans have their own problem. English has their own problem. For example, in English, we say uh, "cut," 
PUT not but put, right? <laughs> so like that, there's so many confusions, you know. So uh, <laughs> I remember one of my classmates reading psychology. He could not pronounce it properly. He said, physiology. I mean, it makes sense. There is a P right there, you know. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> so, prophesied. To his close disciple and attendant, Ananda, that in the future, this boy would be reborn in the snowy north, that is Tibet, where he would found a great monastery. I mean, this is prophecy made by Buddha, and which he did later on. Great monastery, offer a crown to, uh, to a sacred Buddha nature and be instrumental in spreading the Buddhist Dharma. He also predicted that this future incarnation would be known as Sumati Kriti, Lobsang Thakba is the name, even the name. The Tibetan for which is Lobsang Thakba. More than a thousand years later, the great Guru Rinpoche, Pema Sambhava, predicted that a fully ordained monk by the name of Lobsang Thakwa would be born in the east of Tibet near China, and this Bodhisattva emanation would attain the complete enjoyment body of a Buddha. So, so it's full of like such, you know, predictions and things like that. So many things. And then, so okay, so we, we were like thinking about re repeating this, this praise to the Tsongkhaba. So repeat this after me. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of demons without exception. Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of snowland sages. Lobsang Thakwa, at your feet I make this supplication. So meaning that he is an embodiment of all the three. Avalokiteshvara, uh, the deity of compassion, Manjushri, the deity of wisdom, Vajrapani, the deity of power. Huh? Huh? Mixama, Mingma Zavet, this is it. You teach them later on. <laughs> Okay, so rely on the path pleasing to the Buddha. So if you practice this path, the three principles of the path, this is the way you can please the Buddha. Because this is the way to please the sentient beings. And as, as I said yesterday, the way to please the Buddha is please the suffering mother sentient beings. So if you do this practice and practice and develop these three principal aspects of the path, you are the really fortunate one. So those fortunate ones, so those of you who are gathered here, you are fortunate ones. I, I am very thankful to you and to Tushita for giving me this opportunity because otherwise I don't know how I am spending my time in the office, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so one, once in a while, <laughs> I also get this sojourn kind of, you know, <laughs> where I pretend as teacher, but basically I'm learning, you know. So, so, so thank you, thank you. Fortunate ones, listen with a clear mind. That means listen with a clear mind means when it comes to doing good things, you should always be happy. When you're coming for the teaching, come two, three minutes earlier. When the teaching finishes, don't just quickly run. Okay, the teaching finished. Little bit sad. <laughs> Little bit arrangement maybe. And when you come for the teaching, the, the text is say, when you come for the teaching, come with a face, you know, of, with happiness, smile. You know. don't, don't like, you know, don't come to the teaching session like a... Uh, yeah, I have already registered, you know. <laughs> I've given the money, so I have to go, you know. 
<laughs> no, no like that. Come, come with a happy mind. Come with a happy mind. Because the purpose of all these teachings is to, to be happy. <laughs> Throughout your life, you be happy. And I've been, you know, giving this commitment to people. <laughs> it's not a tantric commitment, but a kind of commitment I've been giving to people, saying is, you know, after attending all these teachings, you should make a commitment and say that come whatever in my life, I will never make my mind unhappy. Whatever may come in my life, I will never make my mind unhappy. Can you do that? Good. <laughs> Not easy. <laughs> Not easy, but try to do that, then you will see the difference. Because becoming unhappy is not the solution, that's what I'm saying. Normally when we face some tragedy, some problem, we become unhappy. That is not the solution. Happiness is the solution. For example, if one of your family members dies, then of course you cannot say, I'm happy. Of course. <laughs> you can't say that, but deep down... <laughs> no, no, okay, don't misunderstand. I'm, I'm not saying, deep down he goes, okay, good. I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, don't make your mind disturbed by negative emotions. Maintain the mental balance. Right? Happiness, as I said, is satisfaction. Satisfaction not because the person died, <laughs> but satisfaction because when this person lived, we lived very well. Now nothing to worry. That's important, because unhappiness, crying, you know, yelling, these are not solution. Find the solution, right? So, the commitment is, whatever may come in my life, I will never make my mind unhappy. I will never make my mind unhappy. Right? When you become unhappy, then you can't find the solution, you can't think. Okay? So, those fortunate ones, listen with a clear mind. Listen with a clear mind means when you listen to the teaching, your mind should be pure. Pure means if you come to listen to the teaching with the wrong motivation, thinking that I will listen to this teaching and then once back home I will start my own Dharma center and I become a famous teacher. I mean, there's nothing wrong starting a Dharma center, but your motivation is to become famous and earn money and have many disciples. That's wrong. That's not pure mind. That's not clear mind. Right? So it should not be, motivation should not be polluted. Then also when you listen to the teaching, Retain the meaning of the teaching. Don't listen from this ear and throw it from this ear. Retain it. Give it. Normally we say it, you, you, you should not be like a pot turned upside down. You may be physically sitting at the teaching, but your mind may be thinking about your house shore, you know. The works, you, the unfinished works that you have in Bombay, in, in Maharashtra, <laughs> in... in uh, New York, you know, oh, I need to sell this, oh, I need to close this, you know, oh, what may, what may have happened to my bank balance, you know, things like that. If you're physically here, but mentally everywhere, then you are not, not here, actually. Right? So, therefore, you should not be like a pot turned upside down. If it is a pot turned upside down, there's no way you can put anything inside it. Now, even if the pot is not turned upside down, it is in its right position, but if it is a hole in the bottom, leaky pot, as I said, you, you listen from here and throw it from here, don't, don't retain anything, don't try to remember anything, then it's of no use, whatever you put it, it goes out. Nothing will stay there, it should not be like that. No, even if the pot is in its right position, it's not leaky, but it is contaminated. There are darts inside, bugs inside. Then even if you put a very nicely cooked food there, it will get contaminated and it is not worthy eating. So similarly, 
the wrong motivation as I said. So the motivation should be to remove your negative emotion, to become Buddha, to get liberated, to help other sentient beings, reduce their negative emotions. That should be the motivation. And don't worry about money, don't worry about name and fame. Name and fame will come. If you do your job, name and fame will come. Money will also come. I mean, not necessarily becoming rich, but enough to survive, it will come. <laughs> I've seen many people who just go for the name and fame and money and don't worry, about, don't care about their reputation, don't care, don't care about, you know, what people say, they exploit, you know. Then at the end of the day, nobody pays genuine respect to them. Right? So that, that's the way. So therefore, listen with a clear mind. Okay. Some questions? Questions? Is it on? Yeah. Hello. Here. Hello. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, okay, my question is about love. Oh. And if, if I feel the pull to, to try and follow the bodhisattva path, mm. I still maintain a desire to have a, a wholesome partnership and love. And I'm trying to understand if that's an attachment I should release, or if there's a wise yeah, way yeah. to approach it, like Kalyanamita. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, but, but the major problem or solution is that even if you try to follow the Bodhisattva path, it doesn't mean that you will immediately be able to remove all your attachment. <laughs> so, so your attachment or your love, you know, will be there. So you'll continue to enjoy whatever you were doing. You can't solve it immediately. But it will become more and more pure. It will not be just physical attraction or sexual attraction, things like that. It will become more and more pure. In the ordinary case, it will be more like strong obsession attachment. But gradually, you know. And also in Buddhism we never say it is wrong to marry. We never say it is wrong to have children. Because if there is no marriage, no children, from where these lamas, reincarnations, <laughs> <laughs> monks, <laughs> you see? And in fact, there is a teaching where it says a bodhisattva, through certain power, miraculous power, produce 1,000 children. to contribute to the Buddha's teaching. Then also there is a story of uh, the mother of two famous teachers, Asanga and Vasubandhu, very famous teacher. And she was, she was a woman and she said, unless I have some children who can do really rigorous Dharma practice, it may not be so easy for me to do all this, so I must, you know, have children. So she married and produce these children who become really amazing, great teachers. Asanga and Vasubandhu who wrote many, many texts like that. Right? So number one, attachment will not go away like that. And number two, I mean this question is more or less similar question was asked to me in, in Russia, in Moscow, when I was giving a public talk. So I was talking about reducing attachment, things like that. Then there was a young boy who got up and said, you know, if we are to re re reduce and remove attachment, then how can I love my... Own? And he, I also mentioned about the impermanence and all those things. Then he said, if, if things are impermanent, fragile, you know, then how can I love my girlfriend? He was really concerned. Understandable. 
because normally, as I said, we have this strong grasping of permanence. You know, with my boyfriend, I will always be with him. With my Mercedes car, I will always be with the Mercedes car. You see, so it's for permanently, I will be there. Right. So then I answered. Maybe right answer, wrong answer. Sometimes I'm quite inventive, you know. So I invented an answer. <laughs> Where I said, when you realize your girlfriend is impermanent, you can actually love more than before. If your girlfriend is permanent, you are permanent, your relationship is permanent, why is the hurry? <laughs> you can slowly, slowly, after two years, three years, make some love and then go away. <laughs> But it's not like that. You're not sure when she is going to go away, when you're going to go away. So now is the time to love. Right? So I in invented such an answer. I don't know. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Um, Geshila, when you were talking about the rebirth of ordinary people who are not tulkus or reincarnations, mm. If people have gained a lot of merit and they are very close to being a bodhisattva or barely a bodhisattva, like at the beginning of that path, how does that manifest when they're reborn as a baby in an ordinary family and have to go through ordinary life all over again? How It's like they don't lose, the consciousness doesn't lose the merit, but what does it do when the person's reborn? No, it's not so much about whether somebody's recognized or not. The, no, question, the question is whether somebody is real Bodhisattva or not. Yeah. So there may be somebody who is, as I already mentioned, somebody who looks like an ordinary man, woman, don't have the designation as a Lama or reincarnation, but in the true sense of the term, that person may have a very high level of spiritual understanding and practice, and he, she may be, you know, not suffering at all. Okay. That's possible. Right? And then, of course, what kind of life you will get is depending upon what state of purification you have achieved. Mm -hmm. So depending upon the degree of purification, you may be born as an ordinary man or woman, but your degree of suffering will be less, your degree of you know, happiness will be more. So it's, these are all different degrees, different states. Yeah. So the person wouldn't necessarily ever, I don't want to say remember, but somehow become aware that they had progressed on some kind of a spiritual path. Oh, yeah, yeah, they... yeah. For example, for example, take the example of uh, Atisha, or oh, sorry, Domtamba. Uh -huh. He made a promise that he will always remain as a lay person. He will not become a monk or nun. And when Atisha came, a great teacher from Bengal, came to Tibet, highly, highly realized, you know, we still we study his text the Bodhipat Pardibam, things like that. So when there was a prophecy that they will meet and do many great things, Atisha knows about it, Domdama knows about it. So gradually when they met each other and they started Dharma discussion, dialogue, you know, that the whole text is there still today. You can read it. They would discuss a topic and it become more and more vast and more and more profound. Then suddenly one of them says, okay, now we are, we are going too deep. Nobody will understand it. Come down, let us talk about something which is easy so that people will understand it. So all those dialogues and discussions are, they are written down there, right? Sometimes through their discussion, they gradually go deeper and deeper and then start performing miracles. And then one of them says, yes, I know, you are the real Avalokiteshvara. Atisha says this to this lay person, Domtamba, I know you are your Avalokiteshvara. You see? So you can't, as I said, you can't distinguish much about how people appear, you know, things like that. Then we have the story of Tara Devi who made a promise that she will always, always be born as a woman probably one of the earliest feminists. <laughs> yes, 
So this is, they're, they're great, many great examples, really, these teachers, great examples. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. One, two, three, four. Yeah, yeah, whoever, whoever. I'm, I'm not selecting you. Just. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, can you talk about the desire to be loved and how this can cause suffering, or at least has caused me a lot of suffering? Desire to be loved. Yes, in an obsessive way. Yeah, yeah, in an obsessive way. Desire to be loved, the, 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 I mean, this is, again, not easy. Uh, but spiritually speaking, the most important thing is if you have the desire to be loved, then... First, you should love yourself. Many people, unfortunately, they don't take care of themselves. They don't love themselves. They want other people to take care of themselves. <laughs> they want other people to love them. That is obsession. So first, you love yourself. And then you can expect, but you can expect love from others, but you have no control over there. It's like expecting that there is no rain, there's, the weather is not so hot. <laughs> it should always be like this for the rest of the year. I can expect the weather, but that is just my empty expectation. This is a very good question because this is a very good question because what we, what we need to know is there are things you can change. There are things you can't change. There are things you can't change. The weather pattern, for example, you expect a weather suitable to your <laughs> desire, but, but you can't change it just by that wishful thinking. So that you can't change. And how people behave, whether they love you or not love you, you know, be, you know, treat you badly or nicely, you have no control. So over those things, those things over which you have no control, it is pointless to expect too much. Right? What you need to do is how you have no control how people react to you, you know, but how would you react to other people's behavior? That is under your control. So you pay more attention to those over which you have control. Not those over which you have no control. For example, if I see this tree, if I see a very straight tree, right? Right? So I, I want this tree is straight and very beautiful, very nice. I want similarly other trees also should be straight. They will not become straight like that. I can't change it. <laughs> I can't change it. So the important thing is your response, your perspective is more important. And also interestingly, if your behavior change, if your perspective change, you will get the love that you are expecting from other people. You see? It's like how you treat the flowers. Some people, some person said, you know, liking a flower and loving a flower is different. If you like a flower, you might pluck it. If you love flower, you might water it. So similarly, when you really love somebody, don't expect too much from them, but simply love. Simply take care of that person. Naturally, that person will take care of you. Okay, yeah. Okay, next. Uh, earlier you were talking about like uh, always trying to be happy kind of um, and I was thinking about commitments mm. and outside commitments like whether it's a dinner party, anything else mm -hmm. and these types of things most of the time I'm not happy going to mm. but my wife, my family is like this is what we have to do but it makes me unhappy going. Mm. And I'm wondering, is it better to just not go? Like, say, no. like, oh. say, <laughs> and just, just be like, no, you guys go. 
yeah. and I'm staying home and you enjoy yeah, yeah, and yeah, I, yeah. I'd rather just take the middle way sometimes go <laughs> if you always say no no it, it doesn't look nice to the rest of the family members so sometimes you say you know today I really don't like to go please understand and the other occasions say okay let us go you know so it may not be true that you don't like to go anywhere you know I still can't believe that some places you might like to go. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So, true, true, true. I understand that. It makes sense. That's why I already said, learn to say no politely. Learn to say no politely. And it, it's, it's, it's a good decision. There are things you don't really want to do then you, you should say no politely. I know one actress from England. She used to sit by my side listening to the teaching. And she told me later that before she started studying Buddhism, she was always busy socializing, going for party, things like that. She never had the time. After practicing Buddhism, she, she learned many of these things are useless. She started stop, stopping many of these things. And she, she now says, now I have so much time to do Dharma practice. So that's it. So you don't, as I already mentioned, you don't have to go anywhere. Everywhere, everybody says, come up, come down, you know. No. Okay, yes. Hello, <laughs> thank you. Um, I have a question um, about the rites and rituals. Mm. Um, lots of people are doing things without knowing the meaning of it or expecting something from it. For example, someone going to the church, be church because he wants to go to heaven or things like this or I don't know, offering our stuff. And I was wondering, do you think that rites and rituals can lead to a blind devotion in a way? Possible. Possible. Because many of these practices are diehard habits. People don't know the meaning, simply repeat, you know, parroting, as we say. But that doesn't mean they are totally useless. Because power, power of substances is inconceivable. Power of chemicals, substances are inconceivable. If you know how to use some of these substances, you can create miracles. Like how the atom bomb is made from this small atom from the nucleus of an atom. Power of substance is unthinkable. Similarly, it is said power of mantra is unthinkable. Sometimes you may not understand the meaning, but the mantra itself is like a magic formula. So just by reciting that has also great power. It's, it's almost like a charged thing, you know, magic formula. And it is said some of this, for example, wrathful for example, if you continue to recite some of these peaceful mantras like Om Mani Peme Hum, again and again you become gradually very peaceful. You may not know the meaning. And then some of these wrathful mantras, if you practice gradually, you also become wrathful. His Holiness once during the teaching told the story of one monk from, I think, Gyume Monastery in Tibet. He always used to write, write, recite this wrathful mantra of Yamantaka. Huh? He used to recite it and gradually he says, look, eyes also become very frightening. And he would just look at a gaze at a dog. The dog will just run away, scared, as if it was hit by a stick or something like that. So the wrathful things can also happen. But still don't pay too much attention to just ritual. The most important thing is understand and transform your mind, body, speech. That real transformation will not happen unless you do 
rigorous practice. But again, it depends upon your karmic connection. Some people just one mantra changes their life. Right? So generally speaking, study more, not just do the ritual without understanding the meaning. Right? But but rituals, other things, if you don't go to the extreme, anything go to the extreme is of no benefit. If you go to the if you don't go to the extreme, then there's outside performances like rituals and things like that. They may also encourage you to do some dhamma. It creates an atmosphere. Like this cloth, you know, this cloth nothing. We can all go to market and buy it. But this gives you some you know this is like this is like army uniform. Why why the soldiers use their army uniform to say that their job is to you know, defend the border or fight the enemy, things like that. Why this is? This is supposed to study more, meditate more. <laughs> a reminder. So that way it is helpful. But if you get too lost into these things, then it's of no meaning. Yeah. Uh, my question, sorry. My question is regarding a phenomena that we cannot control. Mm. Uh, so, um, like specifically, I wanted to ask, let's say uh, I get a, uh, you can say a genetic disease, mm. mainly things that happen to us, but mm. we cannot control them. Mm. Let's say I get a disease and I can do nothing about it and I am dependent on medications for the rest of my mm. life. Mm. So how do I train my mind to accept my own reality and get out of that loop of why did it happen to me or... Do the best, as we say, do the best. Under any difficult situation, don't give up. Don't give up. Because it is found. In Buddhism, we, we use the word karmic disease. It may be your karma. That, that doesn't mean you can never change it. Sometimes, even in those cases, people change it through medication, through meditation, through practice. Then the so-called genetic disease also, there's no guarantee. It is found that if your father died at age 52, because of the genetic relationship, you will also die at 52. That's what they normally say, to some extent. But it doesn't have to be like that. There's a genetic manipulation can also happen, you see. So through practice, through meditation, through medicine, that, that gene can also change. Right? So anyway, don't, don't give up hope. Um, so I had a question regarding the middle ground that you talked about in terms of financial. Middle? The middle ground in yeah, yeah, yeah. instead of like aiming yeah. to achieve luxury or poverty. Yeah, yeah. As like a business owner, how, because when you're running a business, the kind of mindset that has been built in is the idea of growth in order to survive. And... Do you have any advice in terms of how to find that middle ground and how to avoid slipping into greed within? Oh, that, 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 that you should be the judge. You should be the judge. As I already mentioned, it should be manageable. Manageable means the first thing that you should make sure is people who are working in that particular company should be reliable people they should be reliable, right, not greedy, right? Then through the teamwork, if it is manageable, you can grow still more, manageable, grow still more, manageable, okay. Rise like a shooting star, <laughs> it's fine. But if you think, you know, maybe if I do this, I have the money, but if I do this, my team and people in the company may not work hard, they are not, you know, they, I cannot trust all of them. If you are undergoing such a situation, then be very careful. Right? So you should judge everything, because nothing comes from one cause, one condition. Everything comes from many causes, many conditions together. So bring into consideration all those contributing causes and conditions. Right? Yeah. Um, hi. So uh, my question is about um, attachment and 
um, a lot of the philosophy says that um, attachment is caused by something making you feel um, happy and then over exaggerating that um, feeling and then wanting to obtain it. Um, and you talk a lot about wisdom. Um, I've been in situations where I can see that it's attachment and I can see um, that what I'm doing is destructive, um, but the connection between like my brain and what I know and my feelings and what I feel are very conflictive and I then will do something even though I know it's not meant to, like I'm not meant to do it or it will be not beneficial. Do you have any tips um, on like practices and uh, I don't know ways that, like things that you can do to maybe like uh, strengthen that connection between your body and your mind and get that wisdom from your head to your heart? Yeah, we have this spontaneous reaction in terms of our emotions. But then you should see whether this emotion, you know, surge of emotion, for example, during attachment and things like that, will it lead to long-term happiness, stability or not? You need to see that. Because we are looking for more long-lasting happiness, reliable happiness, right? So that is our goal. So therefore, will this lead to that more stable relationship, more long-lasting happiness? You have to see that. If it is, if you think that is, then you have every right to continue with that. So analyze it properly. Not more, not for immediate, you know, sense gratification or things like that, immediate pleasure. So make a clear distinction between pleasure and happiness. Pleasure are primarily with the senses. Happiness is primarily with the mind. Right? So therefore, when we talk about long-lasting happiness, we are not talking about pleasures. We are talking about happinesses or satisfaction that you get with your mental consciousness. Right? So therefore, there, you know, you should see the particular relationship or attachment, whatever you call it, if it is going to lead to long-lasting happiness or not. But, I mean, as I said, I mean, we, it's easy to talk about, but it's not easy to remove all the attachment like that. So some kind of attachment will be there with us for a long, long time. <laughs> but, but what we should try to do is try to develop uh, a purer form of attachment as much as possible, more refined kind of attachment, less obsession. So then you remain an ordinary person, you get married, you have your girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, children, so long as it's, it's, it's good, it's okay. Right? For example, when we talk about secular ethics, we are not talking about removing <laughs> attachment. <laughs> right? So if our long-term goal is nirvana, enlightenment, then, of course, these things should be removed. And even otherwise, if you are looking for long-term happiness, then in the long run, these negative emotions will create obstacles, obstructions. So therefore, we should, as much as possible, try to reduce them, distance yourself from them. Like meditation, is that... Like, uh -huh. the, is that done just through like the realization, or is there like... Realization, meditation, many things. Meditation, for example, if you are say, okay, let me tell you this now, the bitter truth. <laughs> the bitter truth is, for example, if you are really, I mean, I'm just talking about it, it's not easy to practice, okay? It, it's almost like replace, believe it or not, okay? You just watch it, don't practice in your home, <laughs> something like that. So, the some of the meditation that we do is, for example, if you have excessive attachment to somebody, say your boyfriend, your girlfriend, then you should study this boyfriend, girlfriend, who looks nice. Right? Then, 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 right from the top of the head down to the sole of the feet, you see the ingredients by which that body is made of. The skin, are you attached to the skin? Are you attached to the bones? Are you attached to the blood inside? Things like that. 
when you peel, as we say, peel the layer after layer, you will not find any essence worth de developing so much attachment. When you peel like that, this is so interesting. When you peel like that and see the real essence, there's a lot of room for developing loving kindness. Oh, this is the state, vulnerable state, fragile state, impermanent state. So I should take care of him or her. Unconditional love, pure love, a lot of room for that. Blind attachment, not room for that. Blind attachment means, oh, it's so nice, you know. Not much there. So therefore, if you go to places like Thailand, near their meditation centers, they have dead bodies all around. Dead bodies one day, two days, three days, one week, like that. So the body that is becoming bluish, you know, uh, devoured by maggots, smelly, and then finally just skeleton. I mean, you don't have to see those real body. This is in, in, in museums, you have this same person. Now you can see it on your mobile phone also. You first have, you first see this very beautiful lady, <laughs> then she's changing, you know, then old women <laughs> with wrinkles, with white hair. Th all these things now te technologically you can see it. You see, so when you see this, there's a lot of, lot of room for pure love, more refined love. Not much room for attachment. So therefore, seeing the reality as it is will help reduce attachment, will help empower the positive emotions. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. Many questions. I, I, I am going to spend the night here, my night here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, it's a very simple question, but yeah. I wanted to know the meaning, the real meaning of Om Mani Padme Hum. Yes, good, very good, good. Om Mani Padme Hum is a very famous mantra recited by Tibetans almost every day. And it is said that our Lokiteshavara is the special deity of Tibetan people. And this mantra of our Lokiteshavara is a special mantra of the Tibetan people. So. For Tibetans, you don't have to teach this mantra. They say things like that. So it's so popular that everybody knows how to re recite this mantra, Om Mani Padme Hum. But not many people know the meaning. So the meaning is, first letter is Om. It's a combination of three letters. A, O, Ma. A, O, Ma. So this three, A, O, Ma, should be understood as having two meanings. One is, a Oma represents your ordinary body, your ordinary speech, your ordinary mind. That is who you are right now. Now through Dharma practice, what you want to do is to transform this ordinary body, speech and mind into the exalted body, speech and mind of the Buddha. You want to become Om Mani Padme Hung. Hung means become one, indivisible. You want to become Hung. That means you want to transform your body, speech, and mind into the body, speech, and mind of the Buddha. Om Hung, that's the meaning. How would you do it? Through money and payment, through method and wisdom. Right? Money means jewel. It's a Sanskrit word. Money is jewel. So that means developing bodhicitta. And then wisdom, the payment means a lotus, which symbolizes wisdom. So it is through combination of good heart and good head, compassion or bodhicitta and wisdom, understanding, emptiness, that you will become Buddha. That's the meaning. Very powerful. Like the three principal aspects of the path, it summarizes all the teachings in one mantra. <laughs> okay, yes, there was one summary. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, you said uh, we will die and our body will die, but not mind. Mm. So where, where will go our mind and where we'll stay till next reincarnation? 
and it will be reincarnated for another body or it can be split for two bodies? It depends. It, it's like, like where you are going to go after the retreat. Nobody knows, except, <laughs> except you or maybe two, three other people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. So even according to Buddhism, we don't know where you are going to go, <laughs> even in this life. <laughs> So in the future also, the mind will, depending upon the, the propeller, the karmic force. You may be born in India, you may be born in Brazil, you may be born in China, you may be born, you know, as a, as a Bodhisattva, you may be born as a cow, whatever, you don't know, it depends upon the karma. Right? And where we'll stay? Huh? we stay in some pool? If you are born as a cow, you will be there as a cow, in India or anywhere. If you are born as a, you know, another human being, again in some other country, it can be anywhere, depending upon your karma. Yes, I understood that. Yeah. But uh, where we stay after dying, like, or we immediately... Oh, okay, okay, okay. Now I'll explain this. Now when, after you die, the body is left behind. Then the mind travels, starts its journey. Before you are born, there is a stage in between, which is called intermediary state, pardo, where the mind is looking for a, just as you came to came here, you are looking for a place to sleep, right? Similarly, that intermediary state is looking for a place to be born. It's wandering. Then it said, when it's looking for its guest house, <laughs> then depending upon, there are many things, many courses are necessary. So then this spirit sees the copulation, the meeting of uh, men and women. If there's not with everybody, but if there's a karmic connection, he sees this meeting as something very interesting. If he is to be born as a, as a boy or as a girl, whatever, he develops certain attachment, hatred, things like that, and because of this, you know, and he sees this, uh, this, this meeting together of the, the blood and the, 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 the egg and the ovum as a, as a garden or something like that. He gets attracted to it and he dies there, he gets stuck there. So that egg and ovum coming from the father and mother becomes his body and the spirit that becomes the mind. Then you, then you are again born and again live a life like that. So this is how it's explained. This is explained in a very precise way, which is interesting, you know. Many of these Buddhist teachings are really interesting because in those days, at the time of the Buddha, there was no scientific instrument. But there is one whole sutra about this, which is called Entering the Womb Sutra. Try to get that and read it, Entering the Womb Sutra. So it clearly says how they meet, how the rebirth is taking place, how the intermediate state goes, and then uh, and what happens in the first week, second week, third week, how the embryo develops, everything is explained there. Okay, last question. Geshe la pranam. Huh? Yes. Okay, yeah. Thank you for all the answers. Yes, yeah. Uh, my question was, if whatever is samsaric um, brings suffering, Yeah. Um, the the physical presence of a bodhi uh, bodhisattva or the guru or the lama yeah. from the perspective of the student still has a samsaric yes yes uh, representation right yes yes so I'd like to know a little bit more about perhaps the levels of samsara or how that desire for liberation creates attachment even to the guru or to the lama yeah yeah true true even to so, the lama even to the guru. You know, when, even when you do not only the bad things, even when you do good things, the good things, so long as it's alloyed with negative emotions, is called contaminated good karma. Contaminated good karma. So that also will become a cause for, you know, rebirth in the samsara, cycle existence. That is possible. And then, of course, the Guru, Lama, it depends who they are, you know. They may be in one form, but their practice may be in a different form. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like that, yeah. So there are different levels of, like, the yeah, objects yeah, of samsara? Yes, yes, different levels. Like, for that's why in samsara, we, the, if you study this bhava chakra, mm. the will of life, mm. 
it's divided into six sessions, primarily six sessions, called six realms. The realm of animals, the realm of hungry ghosts, the realm of animals, and then realm of gods, realm of human beings, the realm, realm of uh, the pretas, the hungry ghosts, things like that, divided into six realms. So, so, so depending upon your karma, you are born into different realms in the samsara. And in which realm does the bodhisattva is reincarnated or? Human beings, normally, generally speaking. But there may be some bodhisattvas who are in the form of animals mm. to help others. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much. Mm. Okay, see you tomorrow. Thank you.